and welcome, Jay. It's so great to have you here with me today. Uh, I would love to start by asking you just to give us in a little bit uh, of your own words about your background and how it is that you got to what you do today. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having me. I have been at the intersection of media technology and AI for the past 20 years or so. Um, I am a musician myself, but I studied electrical engineering. And there's been this tension throughout my entire career, even starting in college. How do you blend a passion for media, a passion for music and audio and production, but with the rigor of engineering? And one way I was able to do it is starting my career at Pro Tools, on the Pro Tools team. So this is a company that is known for having you know, industry-leading software for audio editing, music production, audio creation. Basically, if you see something on Netflix or you hear it on Spotify, it's probably gone through Pro Tools. And uh, early on at that team, I realized that, that you had these two problems. You had people who both were spending so much time trying to figure out how to use the tools and getting mediocre results. And then you had professionals who just wanted to work faster. And so that was... You know, back into the 2000s where my, my, that, that first spark occurred of like, wait, could we use machine learning to make this whole process even easier? And since then, what's happened in terms of like the technology accelerating to make that a reality? And when has it really started taking off? So let me take you into a recording studio. In a recording studio, imagine that you are the like, you're the world famous mixing engineer. And what the mixing engineer does is they take all the raw tracks that are recorded in the studio in advance and they figure out how to set the levels, how to make them sound good, uh, how to add creative effects. And it, it, it's a very long, laborious process to even get it set up. So a lot of the world famous mixing engineers will, will employ an intern or even assistants. The assistant will go in and the assistant will sit down at that you know, ginormous mixing board we all see in behind the music. And you go through track by track. You maybe mm -hmm. solo the track, you listen to it, and you identify, okay, this is a, a male vocal, this is a female vocal, this is a bass guitar, this is a snare drum. One by one, you, you listen to them, you label them, and then there's a set of rules that we all kind of learn when you're learning how to mix and process music. Like if it's a, a female vocal, you might put something called a compressor on there, you might set... The, e the EQ or the equalization to a certain level just to make it sound good. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are things that you learn how to do as an entry-level audio engineer. So that's that like takes, cultivating the art, the foundational kind of uh, bedrock, if you will. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's taking the, the blank canvas and starting to just put the basic outlines there. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of creative decisions are being made. You're just getting it ready so that way the real craft can begin. And that process, if, if you are a very successful, you know, world famous engineer, you have people that help you with that. So you can just sit down and just start your craft and just get right into the, the, the really good stuff, the really fun stuff. But for the other 99% of people, you just have to go through that drudgery of setting up these tracks one at a time. So again, we're, we're back in the early 2000s. Um, we started introducing and seeing technology for instrument recognition. So you could train a machine learning model to do classification, and classification would really just tell you, is this male vocal or is it female vocal? Is this a bass guitar or is it an acoustic guitar? And those machine learning models were, were very good at that classification task, and what they were really useful for is then helping to automate that, that drudgery, that, that process of saying, okay, I've detected this is female vocals, I'm going to automatically put an EQ on there for you. So that was something that um, my experience with it was hands-on with uh, my first startup, Imagine Research. We developed a lot of the core technology to do that. And then that company got acquired by another music and audio software company called Isotope. And Isotope then uh, throughout the 2000s into the, you know, like 2010 through 2014, 15, start shipping more of this intelligence so that way recording engineers and music producers didn't have to do that drudgery. They could hit a button, the software would listen, and then apply these basic foundational things for you. So you're basically 
outsourcing some of the drudgery to artificial intelligence, you're, it can categorize the data in this case being the elements needed um, to have the baseline for audio production. But generative AI, this new type of AI, if you will, is different. Um, so how do you define what it is? And then how is that impacting your industry? So I define generative AI as it's synthesis of information that has not occurred before. And, and it could be filling in the blank spaces that, uh, that, that just aren't there. So let me give you a specific example. We'll go back to audio production. Imagine we're doing a, we're doing a film in the background, there's always this room tone, this ambience. So it could be subtle air conditioning. It could be the sound of crickets outside. Those are the things that make a space unique. And especially in TV and in film, we need that. We need it to feel human. It's, it's very eerie to just hear a completely anechoic you know, voice closely in your mic directly to your ears. So the capture of room tone is one of those things that you learn in audio and TV production, that uh, at the end of a end of a scene, everybody on the set will be quiet. You put a microphone up and you just record that dead air for a long time. A lot of people forget to do it. It's it's just or there's rarely that quiet on the set. So enter generative AI. Um, we now have technology, and so this is actually something we include in the company I'm working at now called Descript that does automatic room tone generation. And so what it actually does is it looks at all the audio across your, your recording and understands what the background sound actually sounds like. And so then you have two options. Once we know what the sound sounds like, of course you could decide to remove it. So if you don't like the sound of the crickets there, great, mm -hmm. they're gone. But the, the most useful use for generative AI in this context is to actually synthesize room tone whenever you have gaps, whenever you have edits. So when someone goes in and says, we need to extend this scene by three seconds, Mm -hmm. Well, you've now generated a void where there is no sound and you can use generative AI to create this automatic ambiance that hasn't existed before. And that's just like, you know, very simple example of it, but you can now take that to other extremes where you're generating automatic ambience, right? And you can even generate human voices saying things they've never generated before. And did you, I mean, so it's basically moving from just being able to classify the data to create something entirely new. And in this context, when you discovered this was possible, first of all, when did you first coming across generative AI in your field? Um, what was the first application? And did you have a moment of, oh my God, this is such a huge breakthrough uh, when did when did the kind of like penny drop for you, which seems to be dropping now for the rest of the world? But obviously, you've been working in this field for years. So, did you have a kind of light bulb um, moment where you're just electrified by the potential of this technology? Yeah, I, I would go back to 2017, actually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 2017, maybe 2018, uh, you see a company called Lyrebird, and so Lyrebird for me was really who introduced me to generative AI, and particularly in the audio field. So, um, you know, I had seen things of like, you know, here are pictures of faces that have never existed before. But what I had never seen is audio generated from scratch that had never existed before. Yeah. So the Lyrebird team pioneered the first platform that allowed anybody to create their own voice clone. And they did that by using a simple web interface that allowed you to just upload a few minutes of yourself talking and then from it, they could easily generate minutes, hours of you t just based on what you typed. So in 2017, I had never seen something like that before. In 2018, this is becoming like really popular where people are now wondering about the, the aspects of deep fakes. They're wondering about how else you could use this to you know, improve your productivity. And uh, this technology is now kind of mainstream. Like we include it in our audio editing applications to allow people to work faster. So, I mean, it's so interesting because that's, uh, that's about the same time when I first came across generative AI and I came across it in the context of deep fakes in the mm -hmm. sense that I was uh, working um, for 
group of leaders was like looking at disinformation. So we were looking at deep fakes as a, a potential kind of disinformation threat. But one of the things we were trying to do back in 2017 and 2018 was some kind of public education program where you allow people to play with deep fakes in a controlled way to inoculate them. But this mm -hmm. is it's a bit of a random tangent, but the point I'm trying to make is that we were looking at synthesizing voice to allow people to synthesize a very well-known voice. And at the time, the audio element, so like the synthesis of voice was particularly difficult. It was way more difficult than doing a face swap. But it seems that since then, that that's not really a problem anymore is because of it was um, the individual elements of everybody's voice was really, really difficult for AI to learn to synthesize well. But right. that we've, we've come a long way from there, haven't we? We, we have. And it, yeah. it's, it's to the point where it is becoming indistinguishable, especially yeah. for, for short snippets and in, you know, definitely for individual words. So I, I use, I have my own overdub voice. I use it daily. Because I will do screen recordings, I'll do demo videos, I misspeak all the time, and the, the flexibility to just go in and fix a word that you've said and have it stitched in is just so And how useful. much, how much, like, what was the input required to create your overdub voice? Did you need to go into a studio, or was that just like you speaking on your phone, or what do you need to create your own overdub? So all you need is yourself speaking in whatever environment you want to be captured in. So you know, in this in this space, I'm using a good mic right now. So I have an overdub mm -hmm. voice using my good mic. If I wanted my voice to sound like it was coming through my iPhone or in a reverberant room, I would just create that overdub voice as well. But uh, the early versions of this, Nina, involved you reading a specific script. And, you know, we've probably all seen like the making of Siri where it was like yeah. reading gibberish phrases to capture all possible phonetics and be... Yeah dozens of hours of training material laboriously edited. Now you actually can upload an existing recording. So you just, we all have examples of ourselves talking. You just take a snippet of yourself talking on a, on a, on a video, put it into the app. Uh, a lot of stuff goes on in the cloud to train it. Um, really behind the scenes, what's going on is we both understand like what human voices sound like in certain languages. And so that's like the, the meta model. And then that next piece is the personalization. So what makes you sound unique? And so, so we, yeah. So it's almost like you have a huge model for, so it'd be like English male voice or something to break it down. And then yep. you would train each individual's voice on top of that. Is exactly, that right? Is exactly. Exactly. That's the refinement step of what, what makes Nina sound like Nina and not sound mm -hmm. like someone else. And so that also allows us to, one, make the models just better for everyone over time by continuing to invest in those, you know, it's like our version of a large language model would be the like speaking model. And then the customization of it comes from your own training data that includes your intonation, your timing, your, your, your pacing, uh, things like that. It's amazing. Um, so we've take we've gone a little bit into the voice synthesis, which is such a fascinating feature of um, AI generated audio. But just going back to the audio production domain itself, we know yeah. that this whole field has been accelerating. Well, I think you know it's we are in the domain of exponential growth. But what are the current limitations of generative AI in the audio production domain? And how do you see these being addressed in the near future? Within production, what I find really exciting right now is we're now at a space that if you can actually dream something, like if you can put it into a screenplay, yeah. you can actually start bringing it together. So let me give, give you an example. If you take a lot of scripted podcasts, mm -hmm. scripted podcasts will involve someone actually going in and typing in the narration that they want and it, it's much more about like building out a Google Doc than it is opening your favorite audio or video processing you know, application. So you type out what you want. You include uh, examples of sound design elements that you want, uh, including you know, background noises and sound effects and things like that. Uh, you know, whether you want there to be uh, ambiance and room tone, if you want some background music. And often this is scripted out in a Google Doc. Yeah. Every single part 
of that is now capable of being fully synthesized. So, you know, so Malcolm Gladwell and his team at Pushkin Industries, they have a Malcolm Gladwell voice clone. So they can use it to get the very first pass at what an episode of revisionist history will sound like with his narration. They can just drop in example clips of, you know, people's interviews to hear what it will sound like in context. But then even things like uh, a synthesis of sound effects from scratch, there's a number of companies that are doing like just generative sound effects where you describe, I need crickets on a windy night in a major city. And then there you go. Now you, you actually have something. You're not necessarily having to sound design it from scratch by pulling from millions of assets. Um, that's another element that's possible. And you know, on the music creation side, uh, those folks will tell you one of the first advances was actually in production music. So searching for that, like, okay, I also need a uh, lo-fi down-tempo orchestral beats behind this. And then you can generate that from scratch. And what, what's the kind of interface people will use in, and, and what's the timeline? Is it literally like you pull up the equivalent of a Google Doc and you throw in your script as well and then you just type in the sound effects you need? Is that how, is that, the, is there, is that going to be the audio production platform of the future and perhaps you're building a Descript? So th that's, I'm glad you really brought that up because what we're seeing now with a lot of tools is we're seeing the APIs available for it. And let's say with chat GPT, you're seeing a desire to just like take this like natural language input and generate text and people are just cramming it into their applications. Mm -hmm. And what really is going to make the difference is it's not the tools, it's not the API, it's actually what you do with it. That's actually the mm -hmm. end goal. So uh, I'll, I'll come at this from Descript's perspective. You know, we're building an editor. We believe in the craft of storytelling of audio and video. And we're going to just continue to build out the tools that give you the best results possible. So if we say, let's, let's, look, at a, a, let's look at transcription. Mm -hmm. Transcription is one of the things that's really driven Descript's success. And it's most specifically, it's the commoditization of transcription because of AI and the cloud. You know, you had Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, all developing their own tools and driving the price to the bottom and making this just like a ubiquitous thing that everybody expects. Mm -hmm. If Descript had said, we're going to be the best transcription engine in the world, we would be in a terrifying position because along comes OpenAI, OpenAI, open sourced Whisper, which is their own audio speech recognition, automatic speech recognition model. So now anybody has high quality transcription whenever they want. So because everybody now technically can plug in transcription in their app, does that mean that everyone will become Descript? That everyone can do text-based audio and video editing? And my answer to that is, is no. It's actually the most thoughtful ways that you can identify what those workflows are and how you integrate them all. So, you know, taking the, uh, the you know, chat GPT examples, it's not just like slamming a natural language writing assistant into every app and assuming it, it's needed, but it could be building an interface that allows you to like just get recommendations on where else a story could go or, mm -hmm. you know, summarize a certain video segment so that way you can put it out on social media. It's, it's those most thoughtful, intentional uses of it that are really going to make the difference and I think help people elevate their craft. So, I mean, I've been playing um, with some of the existing generative AI tools and platforms. And um, it, it, it's really interesting because, you know, the kind of narrative almost seems to be right now that, oh, well, like, you won't need to use your imagination or you won't need to right. work. This this supplants human intelligence and creativity because the AI will do it. But actually, it's <laughs> I've realized that there's it's it's much more a process of like collaborating with the tools. Yeah. It might help you get new ideas, but you still really need to kind of, if you want to produce a good output, you still need to put your mark on it. You still need to kind of use your creative curation process. But it strikes me that a lot of people will think of the 
entire field as, oh my God, this is going to automate humans. And we, I think we both, we've already discussed in the past that we want to have a far more nuanced debate than that. Where do you stand on like how the public is going to view these tools and if there's going to be a impetus to just, um, and perhaps you've already seen it with Descript where people are just like, this this is just automating humans. This is awful. We don't want to engage with this technology. Or have you seen much more of a view that this is like a really exciting way to augment human production? It, it, it's changed so much since summer of 2022, Nina, in that. <laughs> uh, but if I take... I can give you a few examples. You know, one is is voice cloning, for example. So I would do interviews and we'd talk to, you know, top enterprise teams earlier in 2022. And they'd be just terrified about like, I don't know if we like this. This feels a little creepy. You know, what do you do with my data? And then second half of the year, everybody is spilling their deepest, darkest, darkest secrets and uploading pictures of themselves just so they can get a few like comical versions of themselves rendered on a spaceship, you know, like, so yeah. we're, I think, I, I think we're over that. Um, what I, what I am excited about is I'll take it back to music production for a second yeah. because, because, you know, you had mentioned like, this is a way of enhancing creativity and I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that as well. Imagine the role of a music producer. Not many people actually know what a music producer does because it's this like very squishy role. So if you go back and you imagine a music producer is often that person that's part of the creative process and they're giving creative input. So I might listen to a track that you did and I'm like, I think it needs to sound a little more modern and less boxy. And that's a conversation that you and I would have of you understanding what modern and let's say boxy means and we would hone that through just tons of time hanging out. And so in, in mm-hmm. a studio, a producer and the musician, before they even start the music production process, spend tons of time over coffee, over drinks, over meals, talking about what are your inspirations? What do you like? What are you going for? We talk about your values. But then you also look at like, let's listen to some music together and play me some of your favorite tracks. Play me what you want this to sound like. And so I I mention all this because what is now possible is the AI is the the music producer that you can work with and you can educate it on here's some inspiration. You know, I want this in the style of this. Here's some either music or podcasts or content that I want this to be in this direction. And then once you start getting results out of it, so on a music production sense, you can get back a track and now you can tell the AI – I need this to sound a little darker. Well, the AI Mm -hmm. now has learned what darker sounds like. So in the same way that you'd work with a producer, you yourself are still giving the direction. You are making the creative decisions. And arguably, I'd say, that's the fun part that we actually have all wanted. Um, I I love working on music. I love working on video and giving these like bigger creative instructions. What I don't like is figuring out the two to three hours of, of menial work that is involved in implementing that only then to say, Oop, I didn't want to go in that direction. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so really, you're looking at a future where anybody can produce music, right? Anybody, if they have like a, that's not to say that it's going to be good or considered art, but at least anybody has access to tools that can be this kind of iterative, uh, learning process whereby the AI constantly gets better from your direction and you can come out with something, right? Some output. But it's only, I think, the really skilled people who'll be able to do that to a degree where you're like, this is actually worthy. This is artful. This is like the yeah. the creativity and the intelligence is still required to produce something that I think is going to be considered of value, even though anyone will be able to do it now. Right, right. The we have like a democratization as as one kind of one outcome we're going to see and then an increase in in craft as the other so on the democratization side i'm really excited because a barrier to getting your story out 
as a podcast, as video production on YouTube is knowledge of the tools and access to these tools. And, yeah. you know, there there's people are going to mention you know, plenty of examples of like very lo-fi, poorly edited materials that have become a viral success. But overwhelmingly, if you have the tools, if you have the know-how, if you have the budget, you're probably going to be able to produce, you know, really good things. And and I hate that, you know, it's not been available to people that have voices that actually need to be heard. So this is actually just kind of lowering the bar, the barrier to entry, making it so that way you don't have to have like a specialized degree in audio production in order to even figure out how to get your message out there and make it sound polished and professional. And that's going to, yes, it's going to result in more noise, but um, I'm excited that we're going to hear from voices that we've not heard from before and that we have a chance to spotlight and elevate those voices because they're finally getting their stories out. On the craft side, um, I, I would just add that it is going to be just as hard to have a top performing podcast, a top performing YouTube video, but now creators have tools where they can focus more on the craft of storytelling and hopefully spend less time fiddling around with the edit process and the drudgery of media creation. And we have some AI assistive tools to point us in the right direction. So, I mean, you've just kind of really eloquently laid out there how you see the relationship between generative AI and human creativity evolving um, in the audio field or in the production field over the next few years. Um, but what ethical considerations do you think should be taken into account when developing and using generative AI in audio production? A big one. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, how much how much more time do we have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, a, a really a, a big part of it is just authenticity. So um, you can generate material incredibly quickly that is not your own or is like inspired by work that is been done by others. And I could use a, someone else's voice clone if I even wanted to and somebody else's image. And I think we're going to see a proliferation of content that is low quality bar, but it's meant to be eye catching. And we're going to be deluged with that. But oh, my hope is kind of like spam. We'll find ways to identify and suppress it. And then real quality will rise to the top. And we'll all get bored of just kind of cranking out templatized material just to increase the amount that we're putting out into the world. And we'll actually then use these tools for the fun, for creativity. You know, it's like once once you develop a certain amount of mastery of anything, you really get lost in the zone and you can start like focusing on building out your craft with it. And I think we're going to see that too with the AI tools. And you mentioned authenticity and... Um... I think we both agree that given the kind of exponential growth of mm -hmm. generative AI and its just universal applications, increasingly, I would say the majority of digital content, at least the production process, is going to be assisted by AI. So yeah. how do you think about, rather than like, again, I came at this from a disinformation perspective where we were initially a few years ago thinking, oh, we need to detect the fakes. And then I realized right. that that's just not a method that's really going to work. And neither is it going to be practical, practical because so much synthetic content is going to be out there. So much AI made content is going to be out there. It's kind of a useful, useless exercise to try and detect everything that's made by AI. But right. how do you imagine you could like, isn't there a need to authenticate synthetic content? So to show that, you know, this is my AI assisted podcast that genuinely comes from Nina Sheikh or this genuinely comes from Jay. Right. How how do we start authenticating audio that's produced with AI? Well, one of the one of one of the things I, I really believe in is the tool manufacturers. So in this case, Descript has a responsibility to take a position on it. And our position for voice cloning, for example, is we only allow you to create your own voice clone. So no one else can create a Nina mm -hmm. Schick voice clone using our tools and technology through verification procedures that we have. And that also extends to, you know, we won't create 
voices of the deceased. We won't create celebrity voices. So you have your own voice clone. So we feel like we can control that. And there's mm -hmm. always going to be open source tools where if a bad actor or just somebody who doesn't want to abide by your platform's rules can do what they want to do. Um, what is in our control is deciding that this is, this is how we want this part of the world to work, that yeah. we believe everybody has their own voice and their voice should be something that they have. If they want to assign it to others, they can, but it is their voice. Second to that though, um, I, I am going to, I mean, I personally am now so critical and encourage others to be so critical of everything we see, hear, and read to understand, is this a trusted source? Is this, you know, verifiable? Um, are there second sources I can go to for this? Because like, like you said, you know, someone, someone will always find a way to, to get material out there. Oh, no doubt about it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be wild. Um, so what do you, how do you see the interaction between generative AI and traditional mm -hmm. audio production tools using generative AI? Do you think the kind of new generative AI tools are going to replace the kind of tra traditional tools or how do you see that relationship evolving? What we're actually going to see is we're actually going to see the generative AI tools just become more deeply embedded in traditional tools. So uh, going back to Descript, for example, you know, we believe that editing is a, is a craft. It's something that everybody is potentially really good at and needs to get better at. And if we can use Descript as a platform where you can craft and tell your story, then generative AI is just going to provide a suite of more storytelling tools. So the example I used of uh, voice cloning, it's a tool. Yeah. No one's using it 100% for their podcasts. They're using it to fix their podcasts or you know, help with the pre-production process. The automatic room tone generation and you know, the, the research that's being done for sound effects uh, generation, music, those are all just tools and parts of the process. But they're parts of the process that will allow you to work faster, try new creative ideas without needing to you know, go down long rabbit holes or engage specialists and hopefully just get to a result faster and one that you're more proud of. So when I um, spoke to Ahmad, the kind of from Stability AI, the kind mm -hmm. of future he was sketching at, and it sounds like this is true in the audio domain as well. I mean, we already touched upon it, is you basically have these large models that are almost like the base or the foundation. And then the personalization element, if you use the analogy of voice, is your own data, in this case, your own voice. Right. And that then is your own bespoke model. So is there is that how you see it as well, where you 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 have like your core models that you build at Descript and then individuals input their own data. So it's almost like they have their own individual AI for their personalized output. Is that how you conceive of it? Or is that, am I getting the wrong end of the stick here? No, I, I, I think, you know, from what we've talked about earlier, one, that's, that's exactly how our overdub model works right now, where mm -hmm. there's a large model and then the personalization is, is your individual voice input. But also of, of how a creator would want to work. So if you go back to how users mm -hmm. might want to use the product and make it their own, I'll, I'll give you another example from the, the you know, film and TV production. And you know, I, I hope people are gaining a lot more respect for all the stuff that they watch on Netflix right now. <laughs> Let's take a sound designer. So a sound designer is the person who is in charge of creating the, the sonic background of TV, movie, film, and video, and games. Everything from the room sounds to sound effects to uh, how the voices sound. You know, are they really present? Are they raspy? They're involved in, in that whole thing. And when I first started working in this space, the best sound designers would go to gigs and they'd have a, like, I'm, I'm holding it, because they, they would actually have, like, a USB drive or a Firewire drive to go way back that they would take from gig to gig, which would be their own collection of sound effects, things that right. they have recorded over time. This is, you know, this sounds that they've heard in their life that are their own unique sonic elements. But then they would also, like, beg, borrow, and steal sound effects from others and trade. And it very much became, like, part of their identity. It was 
what are the tools that you have that are unique to you, but then also what is your knowledge of them? How quickly can you recall them and implement them? And some of the most talented sound designers like develop this portfolio over time of rich sounds. And the same for, for, uh, for DJs and especially in hip hop, music producers would have just this rich catalog of samples that they were familiar with. They knew exactly when to use the right samples at the right time. So let's take that analogy into using a tool in 2023. If you can help inform the system with your palette that you've mm. curated of the things that you've come across in your life that are meaningful to you, the writing styles that you like, the sounds that you like, the music you listen to, the images that inspire you, um, and you now have recall of it. And if the system can learn and just use that data set, that type of personalization on a user by user level is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So it strikes me, I know we're not really going into music, which I, I will look into separately, but, um, and especially like the whole copyright issue, but based on what you just said, it strikes me that there's a huge potential opportunity for artists or creatives to kind of license their own palettes to serve as inspiration for other people to package up into their creative style. I don't know how you could trace that or do that. Yeah. But isn't that a huge potential opportunity as well? It 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 absolutely is. I mean, we could look at Photoshop plugins or or, or even templates that are Yeah. Available. So, so take uh, Canva has an incredible amount of not only UGC templates, but you know agencies that are kind of putting a few of their templates out there as a way to get attention for themselves and gain some exposure. Um, they're putting it out there in order for people to take and use as their own. Sometimes getting credit, sometimes not. And uh, whether uh, templates are just a more obvious, like you can see and perhaps track this template is attributable to this person. Um, putting out in a, in a model feels squishier now, and I'm wondering how, how might we go and track the authenticity of it and the, the verifiability of like what templates were used in the creation yeah. of this. Similar to you know, for, for music licensing, when you put out a track, if you were using a significant amount of, of samples of other music material, you have to document it. Those, those rights holders have to be compensated not only for the recording, but for the publishing. One of the things, and we touched upon it, is just like this incredible personalization of content that's going to become possible now because of generative right. AI, um, both in terms of creation, but also in terms of consuming content. So how do you see the use of generative AI in the creation or consumption of personalized and adaptive audio experiences evolving? Is it literally going to be like, I I want to read my daughter an audio book um, like Harry Potter and um, we want it read in the voice of Hagrid or how, how do you see, the, see that evolving? Well, I was, you took it to, to almost audio books. I was going to take it to, to audio ads because mm -hmm. the, there's the creative uses of it, but at the end of the day, someone has to pay the for it. So yeah. <laughs> everything starts with ads. So yeah. we'll look in that space. Um, we're already seeing an explosion in customized ads. And a lot of the streaming services were developing their own services that allow people to like, you know, A-B test 10, 20, 30 variants of an ad. Well, now you have the underlying copy that can mm -hmm. be written in infinitely, uh, infinite permutations created. The permutation or the um, personalization of it can come from you, so that's you know based on where you are, your geo, your history, and all sorts of other creepy things that, that they could take it to. And then it's about creating the voice from scratch and synthesizing the the audio soundtrack from scratch. So uh, an example of how this is done now: uh, there's some ad agencies that license the overdub technology and use our overdub API. Mm -hmm. They have voice actors create uh, a, a overdub voice that they use. And there's a campaign in the UK where, you know, every sunglass hut in the UK has its own address inserted into the ad. And so wherever you are, you're going to hear an ad for the nearest sunglass hut based on the weather, the location, and it's in that actor's voice the entire time. 
And it's a mixture of stitching together their original voice because you don't really want to listen to an entire audiobook or even a, a even a 30 second ad that is AI voice generated is still going to sound mm-hmm. flat. Voice mm-hmm. actors are amazing and have such a range of expression and delivery. So really the personalization piece, it doesn't have to be 100%. 25 seconds out of 30 seconds is probably fine to have as pre-recorded. And then it's those other five seconds that are personalized to you and they are so beautifully stitched in, you can't tell that the whole thing isn't, isn't is synthetic. So that's also where like being, being realistic, um, the, 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 bar for a 30 second ad to be fully machine generated is still too high, but personalization within there is something that is already going on. So the personalization right now is like yeah. the sunglass hut closest to you. Um, but the personalization of the future is going to be far more sophisticated than that. Right. Because it, it, oh. it will be like, Hey Nina. And they know that I've been like viewing, I don't know, you know, the sweaty Betty gym catalog online and it'll be like, yeah. isn't that how it's going to work? It's going to be completely bespoke to you, not just based on like your region or your location, but like what you've been looking at, uh, what they know you're interested in, what kind of voice you might find compelling. Isn't that going to be the, basically the, the personalization of the future? What background form? music moves you most based <laughs> on your Spotify listening history or what you've interacted with? I mean, right. The, the sky, the sky is, is the limit on it. And, you know, there are, there's marketing agencies, for example, that Descript works with on the the video side where they will create 20, 30, 40 iterations of a Facebook ad using the Descript app because they can edit things so quickly. But you can see that that will start evolving from like, well, why would I create 40 versions when I could create 40 million versions? And, have much higher tracking and click-through rate. So Jay, what kind of future developments do you think are needed in hardware and software for the continued growth and advancement of uh, generative AI in the audio domain? So one of the things that has been a really a key unlock for a lot of media producers is the ability to have all of their content synced to the cloud. And so if we go back to what we've talked about, we've talked about being able to look across all of your content, not only for the production you're working on, but perhaps it's all of the productions that you have done over the past few years, including all the raw elements, the sound effects, the music, the the scripts, the video, and using those as inspiration. And so um, being able to like have all of your material in the cloud and particularly for the media production industry, this is an industry where like, it is kind of still crazy. We're talking about getting to the cloud, but the barriers there have been some of these files are just absolutely massive. So it mm-hmm. is still is coming down to having fast enough internet connections, having enough cloud storage, having uh, storage providers that can handle just terabytes of data for someone's user information but then having enough processing power in the cloud to to make heads or tails of it. The cool thing. So is this mostly, sorry, so is this stuff still mostly happening in the cloud then in terms of like the processing? It's it's not happening on... All the cool stuff is in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. And and I just offended a whole bunch of like mobile app developers right there. But honestly, for professional media production, um, we can accomplish so many incredible things and we can iterate so quickly because we can do it in the cloud. We can store yeah. these large models in the cloud. Uh, when, when I look at when I look at Descript, you know, if you and I were to take this recording that we have right here, bring it into Descript, make a few edits, and then publish, there's about nine layers of AI that have been like involved in the production process, from optimizing your edit points to automatically like removing your background and synthesizing new ones for you. Um, all of that kind of has to happen in the cloud because one, we have the large models. Two, we have basically infinite compute power. And, uh, and three, it, it just allows you to, to work quicker. So when I am working in my app, app is, is very responsive. My fan doesn't spin up. My CPU isn't really ramping up because mm-hmm. all the hard stuff is happening in the cloud. And then the the final results are pushed down to me. And then the last thing is just um, 
you know, in media production, it's about collaboration and having a multiplayer workflow. So if I can do all the permutations I need in the cloud, then by the time you and I are working on this production together, we all have all the same versions of it. And we can just kind of request new variations, new permutations, and those are just synced to each other. Whereas if it's on, on desktop, you're trapped there. And we're back to where we were in the 2000s. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've been using Descript myself and I'll do it for our conversations. So <laughs> I, I know, you know, how it's, it's unbelievable. I just pull in this recording. I edit the script. I can share it with somebody else to collaborate on. My computer doesn't overheat. I can do it very, very quickly. So presumably that process is just going to get more and more streamlined. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly incredible. And based on, you know, what you told me in this conversation so far, just the ability to do this, to be able to work in this way is so entirely, it's, it's so new and it's just so phenomenal. And what, what we hope is that everyone will be able to improve their craft. So, you know, if we go back, there's allowing people to create material that have never had a voice, that have been intimidated by the tools, that didn't know where to start. I think it's really inspiring that we have tools and devices now coming out that will allow you to get started there. But think of how many times you've started on a project and the devil's in the details. It's more difficult than you thought it was. Yeah. Or, or, or you feel like, you know, my, my video isn't as widely watched as others, maybe it's the production quality. If we can just remove those as excuses for creation and allow people to just focus on their, their craft and their storytelling, but everybody's on the same playing field. Like the quality bar is always gonna be higher because the only excuse to having bad looking and bad sounding content is laziness. And um, you know, rich sound design, just, just need to understand those four tools and then you're good to go. For my last question. Please. Do, do you, so what have you got your eye on? The, we both, I think we both agree, as people who are interested in the space, I mean, you've been working in this for a um, very long time. You're an expert in the field. What do you think is going to happen? What have you got your eye on in 2020? 2022 has been like a breakthrough year for generative AI. Like what's your finger spitz gefühl about what might be coming in 2023? What's around the horizon? What do you foresee? Can I tell you how I'm going to go about finding the answer to that? Yeah, <laughs> you can So <laughs> I, teach, I, I teach a class at mm -hmm. University of Michigan, at Carnegie Mellon, and at Stanford. And the class changes every year. But it's basically about preparing for your career in the media and technology industry. And so it's, it's people that want to be professional creators, but it's also people that want to work at companies like Descript and Canva and Adobe and Spotify. And understanding what that industry is about and how it gets there. The best part of teaching this course is I learn so much from 18 to 21 year olds who <laughs> grew up in a very different time and are approaching this technology in a very different way. And they don't have, and we're never really hung up by a lot of the ethical concerns that uh, an enterprise company might have about using a voice clone. They just want to do it. And so I am going to spend the month of January and February teaching this course, and we are going to really dive into their comfort and what they as creators look forward to and are excited about. Because this next generation of storytellers has access to tools and is going to be able to shortcut their creation process so fast. Like I, I would spend weekends, months, I mean, there's even people that spend you know, four years, years. doing a specialized <laughs> course. And, it, and it's not about just learning like the theory and the tools. Some people just spend all that time learning the tools. And now all that knowledge is just somewhat replaced. So the, I'm excited to see the students realize that they can spend more time on the creativity, that engaging with the generative tools like a music producer in their corner to like say like more like this, make it more like this. No, go in this direction. Try these five other possibilities. But they, at the end of the day, are the ultimate taste makers. I'm excited to see how they want to use the tools. And then we'll, you know, my, my, my job at Descript is business development, corporate development, partnerships. I'll go out and find 
the data sets that our AI researchers need or the companies we need to partner with and license and then plug those tools into the app. But um, what we're not going to do is just start taking every new model that comes out and slam it into the Descript app. And it's just kind of kind of unthoughtful. I think it'd be better to like look at what users really want to do with it, what moves the needle for them. And I can think of no more inspiring group of people than the next leaders of our industry in college right now. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think we're going to see some unbelievable creative stuff coming out soon from a generation which is just intuitively going to know, I mean, how to thrive in this ecosystem. Anyway, I, I'm also really excited to see what comes up with um, kind of young creatives in the space. But for now, Jay, thank I'm you. Thank them. you so much. Um, so great to have you. Um, and I'm sure we'll be speaking soon. And we continue to look forward to the amazing developments in the space. It's going to be a wild ride, Nina. <laughs> yeah.